Um, thank you for hitting the record button. Just a note to everybody, we are recording this event. The ASPA Cascade, um, ASPA, pardon me, ASPA Cascade is a chapter of the American Society of Public Administration. Our chapter seeks to promote public service and advance public administration in Oregon and Southwest Washington. And since the chapter's creation in 2018, members of the board of the chapter at members of the board and of the chapter at large have worked to develop programs and strategies that promote social justice within the practice of public administration. And today's student symposium is one avenue of doing this. So today's event introduces four student scholars whose work engages ideas around innovation, creativity, and resilience in responding to contemporary challenges in public administration. Um, in appreciation for the work of these students it, and in an effort to support their progress going forward, the ASPA Cascade chapter is sponsoring their ASPA student memberships for the coming year. And we're also including these presenters in our chapter panel for the ASPA National Conference uh, in 2022. And we're also pairing them with mentors from within our chapter to assist in developing their written work. Our goal here is for the students of the symposium to evolve, uh, sorry, it, we're, our goal here is for the student symposium to evolve into an annual event that celebrates and uplifts the work of new scholars. This is something that, that our membership finds very important. So thank you again for joining us for this inaugural event. Finally, the ASPA Cascade chapter elections are coming soon. So those of you who are members, please be on the lookout for an electronic ballot coming in November. We have three board positions open this year. Um, and we also have, it's also a board officer election year. So big things are coming. Nominations are still open, so look for more details at the end of um, at the end of the event in the form of a survey to learn more about that. I will now turn it over to our event moderator, Diane O'Day. You're on mute, Diane. Yeah, sorry, I was saying one second, I was trying to click something off. Um, good morning, everybody. Um, I realize I have the wrong logo up there. I'm trying to fix it, sorry about that. My name is Diana O'Day and I am a board member of uh, ASPA Cascade. It's a pleasure to be joining you all today. And today I will be your moderator. Um, I will also, um, in addition to, uh, introducing our wonderful presenters today. I will also be moderating questions. So if you do have questions, please feel free to um, message me privately or just send it in the chat to everybody. And I will read those out loud during our Q&A portion at the end of the presentation. So let me go ahead and move forward with our intro. So the year 2020 is well known for being an unprecedented year. Heightened media attention on issues related to racial justice, public health, and social services took over the airwaves. But at the same time, behind the scenes demonstrates the resilience public administrators and public practitioner students have possessed during this time. Using creative and, and creativity and innovation, they have grappled with social problems and are rapidly changing an uncertain environment. Uh, I just have to say, I'm always struck by the folks who uh, run to a fire, if you will, uh, when something's happening, the folks who run to help. And uh, I think our students, our students today really uh, represent folks who run to the fire. So the events of 2020 happened in an already increasingly more complex environment. Collaborative engagement processes have become more salient as we seek to seek out effective forms of governance. The public sector wor workforce has slowly but surely become more diverse, granting the opportunity for more interests to be represented within the bureaucracy. It's one thing to have people at the table, but the question remains. How do we ensure they stay at the table? How do organizations manage a sense of inclusion 
and representation, both internally and externally. Our first portion of the symposium will grapple with these questions. First, Yvette will describe factors affecting attrition rates of teachers of color in Seattle public schools. Following, Emma, Emma will present a case study on tribal, state, and federal governments worked collabor collaboratively to manage a disaster. So let me proceed with Yvette Gutierrez Morphine's um, lovely bio. So Yvette Gutierrez Morphine MPA, earned a bachelor's degree from Brown University and a master's in public administration from Seattle University. As a graduate of a Title I high school, Yvette has worked in education to support students and increase educational equity as a high school teacher, college access specialist, and completion coach at a university. Yvette's research interests are bureaucratic representation in public schools, education policy, and social justice, in education. So without further ado, please join me in welcoming Yvette Gutierrez Morphine to the proverbial stage. Thank you, Diane, for that introduction. Let me just get my screen shared here. I've been on Zoom for two years now, but I still always ask my screen's up, right? Yes, we go. It's, yeah, it says that you're you started sharing, but it's not quite up yet. Um, give me one second. Let me try that again. There we go. Okay. Um, so once again, thanks everyone for having me. Um, my research was on bureaucratic representation in Seattle public schools. And specifically, I looked at attrition factors for teachers of color. Um, so in the presentation today, I'm just gonna provide a brief introduction to my project. I'll go over the methods and the literature, what I found in the literature review before presenting uh, my results and discussion. And then finally, I did come up with a few recommendations for the school district, um, and then I'll open the floor to questions. So I started by uh, thinking about the problem. Um, and what has been termed the opportunity gap in education is the difference in educational outcomes between white students and students of color. Um, students of color across the board typically see lower outcomes, so with particularly large gaps for Black, Hispanic, and Native students. Um, in that first graphic on the top, uh, which comes from the Seattle Times, it showed performance in Washington. Um, so what, this, what the Seattle Times found was that uh, gaps in school educational outcomes actually persist regardless of overall school, school performance. So even in schools that were dubbed uh, exemplary had educational outcome gaps between white students and students of color, um, just as student as schools that were underperforming um, also showed those gaps. Um, and this is particularly important because the student population, especially in Seattle public schools, is only getting more diverse. And it has kind of kickstarted what some researchers are calling a demographic imperative to make the teacher workforce more representative of the student population. Um, existing research has shown that bureaucratic representation can, in fact, improve outcomes for students of color, um, but in Seattle public schools, uh, as you can see in the bottom graphic, also provided through the Seattle Times, uh, a large gap continues to exist between students of color um, and teachers of color. So at the national level, attrition for teachers of color is higher than for white teachers, um, as has been shown in the research. Uh, in Seattle Public Schools, it's actually a little bit better, but it's still presenting an issue or a barrier to bureaucratic representation. Um, the district has actually started a lot of important initiatives and placed a lot of focus on recruiting teachers of color. Um, but the issue is, is that 21% of the teachers who leave the district year to year are teachers of color. And that's about the same rate 
that teachers of color actually enter the classroom. So this has meant that levels of representation are either static or actually slowly decreasing. Um, as one of the goals of the district is to achieve a more representative uh, teaching workforce, um, attrition has become an issue that they're really focusing on to try to increase the percentage of teachers of color in the classroom. So the goal of this project was to understand why teachers of color leave Seattle Public Schools and to see what, if anything, the district was currently addressing retention. Um, so my research questions again were, why are teachers of color leaving SPS and how is the district ad addressing retention for teachers of color? Um, the literature review shows several factors that are likely to increase teacher attrition. Uh, here, I organize them by level of analysis, so focusing on um, individual teacher factors that may increase uh, turnover intention, factors at the school, individual school levels, um, and then overall district factors. Um, at the individual level, um, research showed that teachers of color and teachers in general really tended to leave the classroom due to a perception that there's a lack of career opportunities. Um, there's nowhere really to go once you're in the teaching workforce. Um, at the school level, uh, student demographics really showed were really shown to have an impact on whether teachers uh, stayed in the classroom or left. Um, Title I schools, schools with high levels of students on free and reduced lunch or high levels of students of color tended to, tended to see more teacher turnover than um, other schools. And then at the district level, um, Stuart, England, and Meyer found that lack of bureaucratic representation, especially on the school board, um, led to increases in uh, turnover for teachers of color. Uh, for this project, I conducted uh, 10 semi-structured interviews with current and former teachers in Seattle Public Schools. Um, I also interviewed district level leaders. Um, and then once I had all of the interviews, um, they were coded and I analyzed their responses looking for uh, thematic commonalities between uh, different responses to different questions. Some of the results that came uh, from my interviews, um, I found that racism and microaggression were brought up by a lot of the teachers of color. Um, this focus most, mostly on colleague to colleague and leadership to teacher microaggressions. Uh, one participant in particular said, um, I can deal with racist parents, I can't deal with racist coworkers. Uh, com compensation was another frequent theme, um, but this went beyond wages. Um, many teachers of color talked about ways that they weren't um, either supported or paid for uh, work that beyond, went beyond just uh, kind of like instruction. Um, they talked about emotional labor, um, the mentorship, all the other pieces that go into teaching. Um, one teacher uh, commented that her reason for leaving the classroom was that when your aggravation no longer meets your compensation, it's time to go. Uh, district report support was also frequently cited. Um, Teachers reported that they had a, there was a sense that they were on their own, that the district wasn't really addressing issues of equity and was instead putting it on the teachers of color to kind of bring up these topics and address them. Um, this was closely tied to compensation. Again, um, the sense that teachers of color were being asked to do more, but not necessarily receiving um, either a support to do so or extra money to do so. Um, and then lack of active representation was also brought up. Um, several teachers, in fact, reported that passive representation or just having um, folks of color in leadership positions at schools or in the district didn't seem to lead to active representation in the class, in, the, in this case. Uh, one teacher, in fact, noted that some of the most, uh, and this is quoting the teacher, some of the most harmful administrators they worked with were actually administrators of color. Um, so in Seattle Public Schools, what I found was that passive representation was not leading to active representation. Um, teachers also cited working conditions. Um, teachers who worked with a lot of students of color or in schools with high 
uh, student of color populations experienced negative working conditions or extra labor. Um, as an example, one teacher of color was given the majority of the students of color in the school and the administrator said they had a do no harm policy. So, and that those students were being harmed in classrooms with white teachers. Um, so again, this uh, theme of extra work for teachers of color uh, comes up plus working in environment of racial hostility. Uh, lack of training. Um, was reported as well. There was a lack of awareness or no training at all for the emotional labor that teachers of color were asked to um, take on. And then all, teachers also cited autonomy as important to creating trust and freedom for teachers. Uh, they experienced some barriers there, um, which again leads to led to a breakdown between uh, in trust between teachers of color and leadership. Uh, one teacher, again, reported that a white teacher can make the exact same mistake, but if a black or brown teacher makes that mistake, it's weaponized. Um, and then finally, they did. several teachers did bring up opportunities to uh, increase retention. Um, they asked for training, again, to on educating white teachers on race and ethnicity to reduce bias. So based on the results, along with um, what already exists in the literature. Um, the literature noted several antecedents to teacher turnover. Um, the results of the interviews for the most part were in line with those antecedents, but emphasized the role of race. Um, I found that race and ethnicity were actually moderating factors. Uh, the antecedents are felt more intensely by teachers of color than they seem to be felt by the white teachers that I interviewed. Again, this breeds a lack of trust, a work environment where teachers don't trust their leaders to address equity issues, but also feel responsible to their students. Um, so, so feeling like, you know, if the teacher of color leaves the classroom, who's going to take over, who's going to take care of their students. Um, so the antecedents with race as a moderating variable, I found actually lead to the processes of teacher attrition, which I've categorized as um, racist experiences and microaggressions, um, the brown tax, and emotional labor and burnout. Uh, so some of the antecedents that came up in the interviews and were again reinforced by the literature, again, organized here by level of analysis. I looked at individual factors, school factors, and district factors. Um, so community, within the school, for example, is an antecedent that can lead to racist experiences. Um, teachers of color who um, worked in schools with very few teachers of color were reported feeling microaggressions or experiencing um, racial violence at a rate that was a little bit higher than others. Um, leadership in the school in the school can lead to the brown tax. So that, again, that example of being asked to take on all the students of color because they were being harmed. Um, in another classroom. Uh, and then student demographics can lead to emotional labor, thinking about um, some of potentially some shared lived experiences or uh, taking on the emotional labor of being mentors to students where other teachers are not asked to do the same. Um, so the opportunities for remedies in this case occur between the processes and the turnover intention. Um, one of the things, again, that came up over and over again for teachers that I interviewed was um, a lack of training, for example, around racial, uh, around race, around power, privilege, um, and how that manifests in the workplace. Um, so after a racial incident occurred, a lack of follow-up from leadership or a lack of um, response from the district really led to, again, that breakdown in trust and feeling like teachers of color were alone. Uh, in, in their workplace. So some of the recommendations that I uh, came up with, uh, I'll just go over a few here. Um, at the individual level, Seattle Public Schools um, ha does have some racial affinity groups. Um, participation in those can help uh, mitigate some of the uh, effects of being the only teacher of color in a school, for example, if you can work with other teachers of colors in the district uh, and have a chance to discuss what that means. Um, at the school level, racial equity training, again, uh, seemed to be something that teachers of color continuously asked for um, in helping to educate their white colleagues and white peers on what it means to be a teacher of color in the district. 
Um, and then finally, at the district level, policies that could provide monetary compensation for some of the unpaid labor that teachers of color are being asked to do um, could help uh, provide a remedy for teacher turnover intention. And then finally, uh, thank you for listening. I'd like to, if there's any questions, open the floor. Um, or if you think of any later, provided my contact information. Excellent, great job, Yvette. Yes, claps, 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 claps. I know you can't see anybody right now. So we figured that since the group is fairly small that we will just open up questions where I don't need to moderate. It's a pretty good group of folks. But first off, let me send you this question that Sarah already typed um, just to get the, the ball rolling. So Sarah asks, was understanding where teachers were going part of your research? Were teachers of color who left leaving teaching altogether or were teachers of color who left leaving teaching altogether going to better or different teaching situations? And that's in the chat if you need to reread it. Yeah, um, thanks, Terry, for that question. Uh, it wasn't something I specifically focused on in my research, um, but the teachers who left, um, they did leave the classroom, but they didn't necessarily leave the district. I talked to several who went on to become school counselors or school psychs. Um, so it, it felt like they were still looking for that connection and wanting to help students. Um, but there was something about uh, being in the classroom itself that was harmful. Um, there were some that left to do like private education consulting or work for private education firms. But for the most part, it was uh, just leaving the classroom and finding other roles in schools. Um, but I think that's a great uh, potential follow-up research project is, you know, if teachers are leaving, where are they going? Sarah, did you have any follow-up comments or questions to that? No, I mean, my follow-up comment is thanks for that answer. And I find that really interesting. So let me know what you learn as you... <laughs> travel along this path further. Um, yeah, I find that really interesting. Yeah, that is interesting, especially in consideration of motivations and what motivates us and how public service motivates us. And, um, you know, anecdotally, I would assume maybe a lot were leaving for private after, you know, all, all that stuff. But so it, this is very interesting. So Masami had a question in the chat. Um, any suggestions for the administrators of color? Other than the lack of active representation, what are other aspects of administrators of color that the teachers of color lacked or acting in a wrong way? Yeah, um, thank you for that question. Um, I think the teachers, uh, I spoke to the administrators, they were specifically referencing uh, face a lot of pressure from the district and to carry out the policies that are maybe being made at the top level um, that they didn't necessarily have a lot of input to. So I think part of it is increasing transparency and participation in that policy creation process. Um, the district is putting together um, or like they've re kind of issued their mission to place a specific emphasis on anti-racism work. Um, but it, but the teachers I talked to said it spoke, it spoke of it in terms of it's a very like closed um, process. So like at the district, they're saying what anti-racism work means and then they're kind of trickling it down to let administrators of color actually carry that out. Um, one suggestion I would throw for administrators of color is, you know, it's hard for one administrator to kind of push back against some of those policies and feel like they can have uh, the autonomy in their schools to put forth what they view anti-racism work as. Um, but again, these racial affinity groups, I think ha have the potential for a lot of um, collective power. So um, kind of, I would, my top suggestion would be breaking down some of the, that silo, right? Of getting administrators of color within the district to talk to each other, work together, put forth their vision um, of what it actually looks like to carry out some of these district policies in the schools, how it's actually playing out um, and then what, what needs to change, what needs to be better. Um, so I think, again, that collective piece seems to be missing. I hope that answers the, your question. 
Yeah, thanks for that. That was a really good idea, I think, to have this kind of information sharing and breaking down the, the silo across uh, different schools. Uh, no answer also seems to suggest that there's a lot, I don't know why I should say a lot, but there may have been some work needed at the district level as well. If they are just making the policy top down and expect that the administrator will implement, I think that is an unrealistic expectation, right? So it is very worth it all levels, and I'm so glad that you highlighted those issues at this in a very systematic way. Thank you. Yeah, Yvette, that was a, that was a really that's a really good idea to have that that cross collaboration that uh, Emma will actually talk about in a different way, but it seems like that that's kind of a way to start concentrating your power and then also demonstrating that you have that power and you can use it for advocacy um so fun fact the joys of zoom i just spilled an entire cup of coffee in my lap you can't see it but if you saw me jump back and start laughing that's why so i'm going to ask the next question but then i'm going to mute my video so if i'm not back by the time eva answers it sarah can you take over and asking the next question um i just need to go get some towels but um so paul manson asks is there a baseline of burnout or turnover across all teachers to compare this type of burnout to uh, there is at the national level, I can't remember the exact number at the moment, um, and Seattle Public Schools is actually doing better than uh, the national level for burnout for teachers of color. Um, the issue is, is that the, they are in Seattle Public Schools, teachers of color are leaving the classroom at the same rate that they're entering. So they're not keeping any teachers and thus they're not able to increase the representation in their teaching workforce. Um, I think the last time when the last time I looked, um, they were entering the classroom at a rate of 19%. So 19% of new hires were teachers of color, but they were leaving at 21%. And that was a flip from several years ago, the last time they pulled this data. Um, so it's either remained static or actually decreased in the last few years. Um, so while they are doing better than the national average, um, it's still not enough to reach their goal of having a representative workforce. I've got, um, sorry for the pause, I've got so many buttons here. So I think we've got time for one more question. Um, and Vincent asks, what is the average years of service for teachers of color before feeling burnt out to the extent that they felt um, that leaving the teaching profession was, was their decision? And what type of support does the Seattle School District provide to newly hired teachers of, of color to prevent these things? Yeah. Um, I didn't necessarily collect average years of service. Um, most of the teachers I talked to said they left within three to five years, um, which again is better than the national average. Most teachers tend to leave after their first year of teaching. Um, uh, Seattle School District is actually doing some interesting new things. They have a, a teacher of color kind of pro pipeline that they've created where their goal is to help, they'll pay for um, teachers from certain neighborhoods, they'll pay for their college to actually, um, if they then promise to come and teach in their neighborhood school. Um, so trying to really emphasize that community connection as a retention tool, right? Like this is your home, these are your people. Um, as far as support once they've arrived, um, they do provide some training um, and they have started to roll out some training on equity, on race, on uh, microaggressions. Um, but the teachers I spoke to, again, felt that that was all being put on teachers of color to develop those trainings, to lead those trainings, to educate their white peers. And that was a form of labor that they weren't being compensated for. Um, so the intention might be there to start addressing some of these um, issues that are causing teacher turnover intention, but the rollout of the process is actually leading, in fact, to some of the more veteran teachers of color to start experiencing some of that burnout, which causes its own issues again. Um, so yeah, I hope that answered your question. 
Okay, I'm back. Did a costume change, but but you didn't know this was going to be a costume change and extravaganza. Um, Yvette, I had uh, there's no more questions in the chat, but I had a question uh, related to Vincent's question. Um, so you mentioned that a lot of folks leave teaching within one year. I've seen it myself. It's usually um, not usually, I should <laughs> make generalizations, but one thing I've observed is that people go in uh, with this idealistic, I'm gonna fix everything, I'm gonna change the world. Um, so how, what kinds of ideas do you or anyone have <laughs> for um, kind of, how do you prepare students before they enter the workforce, in particular, uh, students of color, how, how do you, how do you convey to them, uh, like, do you think there's a gap in education since you are a teacher? Like, how do you, how do you convey to them that it's, it's hard work and that it's, it's not easy in essentially, how do you, how do you get them battle ready? Yeah. Um, I think for teachers of color in particular, um, it might be about framing it in terms of systems, right? Like folks of color in this country have been experiencing these systems and battling these systems uh, from the moment they enter it. Um, so if we can, if it can be framed in terms of like, you've been through the education system, you know what it's like, right? You're, you're probably, for a lot of the teachers I spoke to, their motivation was like, it really sucked for me in school and I want to, it to be better for my students. Um, so I think the knowledge is in fact there. What I think happens though is like that again, feeling of, of uh, isolation and loneliness of being the only teacher of color in a school um, who has had these experiences and who joined the profession for this reason. Um, so I don't know if it's a question of battle readiness as much as like uh, building that community. Like I, I feel, I think teachers of color, especially they, they know it's going to be a battle and they know it's going to be a fight. Um, but when you're fighting alone, it's really hard to keep up that energy, um, and to not, uh, burn out. So I think in, again, increasing the diversity of the teacher workforce, building that community across the district, feeling like you have folks you can lean on, um, when things get tough, when it feels like that's never going to change, um, is really critical to, um, uh, reducing the levels of burnout that I saw in these interviews. That makes sense. You know, um, I was in a class the other day and someone said, well, you have to start changing the conditions for people to start thriving. So um, I think what I'm hearing from you is that formalized affinity groups and mentorships and sponsorships um, is really important as it pertains to supporting uh, teachers of color. Um, I also, this is just a random thought, but I wonder uh, how, how much work needs to be done and as we start moving away from, okay, you're just a teacher to you're a teacher and you have valuable mm -hmm. policy input to provide to us. Because I think that piece, that policy input piece is often missing. Yes. Um, okay, any other questions for Yvette before we move on? I think this was excellent. I could talk about this all day, so I won't take up too much more time. <laughs> all set, okay. Well, Yvette Thank will you. still be here, so you can follow up privately or through email that Yvette shared. Um, so we're going to move on to the next speaker. So let me, I'm going to share my screen so you can see, read the bio along with me. Emma Cutler is a senior environmental studies and political science major at Reed College. Their areas of research include American disaster politics, wildfire policy, and government to government relations between indigenous and non-indigenous states. Emma's work has been heavily influenced by the experience, their experiences as a farmer and outdoor educator and the time spent living in the American Southwest. They are currently working on their senior thesis that investigates knowledge exchanges between indigenous and non-indigenous wildfire managers in the Pacific Northwest. So as you all know, 
2020 and the preceding years have uh, we were, we are experiencing a crisis as it pertains to wildfires here in the Pacific Northwest. So um, we're very excited to welcome Emma and hear a little bit more about disaster management um, amongst tribal nations. So Emma, take it away. Hey, thank you for such a lovely introduction. Um, I'm also gonna see if everyone can see my screen. Let me see. <laughs> um, How are we doing? Yep, we can yeah. see it. Cool. Okay. Let me move some things around. Oh, right. So thank you again, Diane, for such a lovely present um, introduction. My name is Emma. I'm a Cutler. I'm a senior here at Reed College, where I study environmental studies and political science. So this particular project came from a class that took a few semesters ago uh, regarding disaster politics, and it really kind of launched me into my mainstream of um, research nowadays. So tribal disaster management and intergovernmental relations. And I use uh, the waters crisis, the warm spring reservation and as a case study within this presentation. But this this area of research comes from um, my or my interest in this area of research comes from my fascination with how knowledge and certain social and cultural constructs create um, risk and ideas of risk and also perpetuate said risk and how that um, how disaster emerges from there. So I'm going to begin um, by addressing the case study that I look at. So this is an ongoing case study. It's occurring um, now. So this disaster has not quite been resolved and it's also, it's not central to a particular year. Um, it, there were instances of um, water leaking and hazard in 2017 and prior. So this, the, the, the warm springs water crisis refers to um, failures in the tribe's water main um, infrastructure. So the degree of severity of the disaster has kind of varied over the years, especially as the infrastructure has aged. So in 2020 in particular, um, there's a major break in the, river, in the, the main water line and it left more than 60% of residents without regular access to potable water. And, you know, 2020 pandemic times. Um, so this came right smack up in the middle of COVID and also the 2020 Oregon fires. So there's a number of um, ongoing disasters that was further exacerbated by the lack of potable water and water accessibility within this um, in the tribe. So I'm gonna look at a few, um, I'm interested in how governments were communicating over, over these, this disaster. So I, this question, this research question I kind of posed to myself was, how do intergovernmental relations um, between tribal state and federal governments affect tribal disaster management? And this is kind of getting at those, how are those pre-existing social and um, historical dynamics affecting tribal, um, tribal government's ability to respond to disaster? So my theory, one that is not necessarily nuanced is intergovernmental dynamics influence how tribal governments manage disaster. And I think social capital offers tribes a really um, tri offers tribes a way to increase disaster preparedness, improve and improve their disaster response. So I, I'm taking a rather topical um, approach to engaging this case study and kind of seeing what factors are existing, and you know where um, what, what 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 relationships are are occurring. So in order to do that, I use a pressure and release model. So this is a model that's adapted from Weiser et al's original pressure and release model. Um, and it looks at how certain social and like larger contextual conditions um, create disaster. So in the Warm Springs uh, instance, the, the tribes have been exposed to a number of uh, um, dynamic pressures and that are that are that are stemming from root causes. So that could be, you know, limited access to power structures and resources. There's um, differing ideology um, between key actors, and how these root causes kind of um, become more specific, driven by the context. And as you can see there on the right, that hazard it's an act of God, uh, not necessarily man-made, um, and how these two how social vulnerability and hazard is coupled to create disaster. So 
talking about the historical significance and the role that historical dynamics get in um, play within this model, I, I use, uh, I referred to the extermination and self-determinism pendulum, which is kind of used to describe how the dynamics between the US federal government, the tribal governments and state governments have um, changed over time. And as a pendulum suggests, you know, it, it moves and it's not necessarily linear. So you can see there on the right, um, the Indian policies marked one end of the, the pendulum, one marked by extreme violence and um, extermination, frankly, that um, it, it, it characterized the dynamic between the early United States and, and tribal nations. So as we see this like progression down the line and these relationships evolve, how, how, are, how are these, you know, how are these governments interacting? And namely, we see how the, the, the structure of the United States has affected relationships with um, tribal nations. So namely, like most, an, an important thing to note here is how um, states and tribal governments interact and how the federal government and tribal nations interact. So the US and the constitution has uh, treaty making authority meaning that the government can uh, chooses to recognize the legitimacy of other governments. And in recognizing and developing treaties with other um, tribal nations, they kind of establish, establish this government to government relationship. And meanwhile, the state governments being um, not retaining state states uh, full like nationhood, <laughs> they interact with tribes in a very different way way and the distinction between these two relationships have affected how tribes are engaging with both um with with each with each government type over over time so as you see here as they progress along the pendulum um there these these state tribal relationships are very litigious in nature they're they're being addressed in court they're um, they're not necessarily, it, it's not a, for, like a, a diplomatic request and approval process. And right now, I mean, it, based on our work, my work, is that we're, we're erring towards this era of co-management. And I'm curious, what are the conditions in which this is occurring? So this is where it, I kind of, you know, dig into my case study. And so the Warm Springs tribal government, um, their, their response to the disaster is not necessarily surprising and neither is the federal government's, but where I find, I take a lot of interest is in how the Oregon state government has responded. It's rather unusual, um, but I'm gonna first start with how um, the, the Warm Springs tribe has responded. And it's largely, largely been um, a lot of infrastructural band-aids. So they're operating within their institutional boundaries and capabilities to, to address the water crisis. And interestingly enough, so in their emergency operation plan, there's um, quite a bit of work done around the criteria upon which they will reach out to external networks. And, you know, this is an example of, or a codified example of, you know, how a tribe might be using or could use social capital to, um, to manage and um, prepare for disaster. And so, and so the, that, that bullet point underneath the local resources bit kind of is um, a stipulation around there. Interestingly enough, despite the, the extent of the disaster, the tribe has not requested federal aid. And there's a lot of stipulate, like there's a lot of, um, the, 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 it lacks, we're not entirely sure why. There's some stipulation around, you know, whether it's the right, like the, the federal government is just expected to respond because it, there's there's a number of treaties in which um, have been the premise on like, excuse me, I'm getting ahead of myself here. <laughs> um, how tribes have created treaties in historical context and how the gov federal government should respond simply because of those treaties and aid should not have to be requested. So the federal government's response um, has been confusing, frankly, and inconsistent. So the EPA, as this disaster has been ongoing, has been one of almost not retribution, but has threatened to find the Confederated Tribes of the Warm Springs for endangering human life, even though 
on multiple occasions, it's been made very clear that they lack the capacity or the resources to fix that, that infrastructure. So on one end, the EPA is threatening to find the Warm Springs tribes, whereas on the other hand, the Bureau of Indian Affairs, um, you know, support, um, delivered $400,000 in, you know, clean water, potable water, and also issued a statement that was uh, really indicative of the, the disconnect within amongst um, federal agencies. You know, here we see like, you know, the trust relationship is shared by all federal agencies, not just the BIA. So the BIA is kind of like, you know, hey, um, th this is not our peer responsibility. There's other federal organizations that need to be in contact, you, the tribe needs to be in contact with. Um, so this, the federal government's response is confusing though un not unsurprising, given that the tribal government has not requested federal aid. Um, would that response change once a federal request has been made? We'll see. It, given that it's a matter of ripeness, um, there's still more to learn. So now that we've kind of, I've engaged with tribal governments and the federal government relationship and how they've interacted over treaties, um, looking to the state government. The state government's response is kind of um, confusing in the way that, you know, referring to those historical litigious relationships, why is suddenly the state government providing all this unrequested aid to the Warm Springs tribes. I mean, they 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 approved three point six million dollars in um, in aid and had another seven point eight million dollars earmarked for future um, relief projects. And they cited that this was you know largely inspired by it's a it's strategic response to COVID nineteen that um, in aiding the tribes establish um, and respond to. Uh, the water crisis and have access to potable water and more hygienic ways of taking care of um, themselves that you know it would it would reduce the spread of COVID-19 and so this is an example of like oh there, there's the state government is, is addressing that there there's um, a common interest a common concern and where previously this is this has not been necessarily the case um, typically the state governments are very hands-off and they only interact with tribal governments when um, when really forced to, frankly. And so beneath that is an issue, like a, a statement issued by a state representative, Daniel um, Bo Boehm, Boehm, and he his sentiments are really interesting. So it says, you know, although Warm Springs is a sovereign nation, they're also my constituents. So here is a state representative recognizing that, yes, these, this tribal nation is a sovereign nation, but also a constituent of a state representative. So th there's, there's a lot of really puzzling relationships going on here. And this is just an example of how um, different state actors within different state frameworks are engaging with these social connections between 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 government types and how um, how people are engaging with disaster and those social constructions around it, and my 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 initially when I read that I was like, oh, is there a new form of intergovernmental relationships emerging here? Um, so this kind of brings me back to this idea of linking social capital. So linking social capital is you know the ability of actors to access resources um, by virtue of their membership in social networks and those networks extend beyond their immediate community and so this is again an example of there there's some sort of common interest here that there's a, a common ground upon which actors are standing and standing upon which in, in a way that's not historically represented so what's going on here and i don't think it's entirely clear and this is how I come back to it being so topical. It's it's a deviation from traditional tribal um, state relationships and exactly what's occurring is unclear. So again, I think social capital is a way to reduce friction and improve disaster management. And yet there's still so much unknown. Like there's so many ifs, ands, or buts throughout this presentation as you probably have all heard. Um, so, so much more is needed from this research. I mean. Indigenous um, representation within public administration is exceptionally low. Um, and this is driven by historical um, historical marginalization in which that, that goes all the way back to the Indian policies at the time in which the you know, United States was um, creating its infrastructure and governmental dynamics and indigenous people were not a part of that. And yet they're treated, um, they're treated as on the peripheral. 
So I need more in-depth analysis of the Warren Springs case study. So this is also a matter of ripeness, given that it's an ongoing case study. There's a lot of information that's recently becoming available. I found a fantastic article the other day um, that's looking at a number of different um, new interactions between the federal um, government and tribal government. And so I also need additional frameworks to build upon. And that also has driven me to maybe I need a different research question. Maybe I need something a little bit more specific. Should I just focus on the tribal state relationship given that it is such a unique example of this changing dynamic? Do I look on the federal tribe relationship? Um, maybe simplify it simply to social capital. So again, this is just a very topical, um, exciting case study. And I'm looking forward to hearing y'all's input on maybe um, ways I can engage in more in-depth analysis from the worms um, of the Warm Springs case study or um, frameworks that I could use. So thank you. And I look forward to your feedback. <laughs> Great job, Emma. Yay, everyone, please give Emma a round of applause. Um, Emma, <laughs> I think you just said there's still a lot that's unknown. Um, mm -hmm. I think that just that that sums up a graduate program. Uh, so you're already way ahead of lots of folks because that's that's pretty much what every uh, thesis ends up in is, well, there's still a lot we don't know. Um, <laughs> so I do want to point out that uh, Masami wrote a comment and asked a question. So to Emma, great analysis of disaster with intergovernmental relations and social capital. Um, what's your next step related to the research? And then also, uh, Masami, and as you know, we have also done this, uh, wants to do a shameless pitch and recruit you to the Portland State MPA program. Uh, we also have an emergency management and I want to say community resilience certificate. Masami could probably say more on what the acronym means but yeah so what are what are your next steps what are your what direction are you headed in right now for this particular case study yeah yeah um i think it'd be fantastic to do interviews at a time that it, it's safe at a community way um i think it would be fantastic to do in-person interviews which i understand covid is a limiting factor in that way but I want to get um, a, a, a deeper, um, deeper insight in how tribal um, officials are interacting with state and federal officials, because the feedback that I've been like been getting from um, the feedback, the literature I've been reading and the interviews that I've been reading are largely like very, very formal and kind of are. It, it, they don't really paint a, a rich picture of what's going on. Um, so I feel like actually engaging with officials could be very beneficial. Um, and yeah. <laughs> that makes sense. There's, it sounds like um, you would want to, in your heart of hearts, like if you ever expanded this, maybe shift your research method to get more, more nuance and complexity in it, um, which is, that's cool. Yeah. Um, so Sarah has a question. So I'll turn it over to Sarah to ask you the next question. I have too many words to put into chat. So I'm just going to ask Fantastic. direct in my, in my wordy direct way. Um, so your, your research is really interesting to me. I just got finished writing up a case study of civic engagement as it relates to immigrants and immigration in Madras, Oregon. And as you know, Madras is, it borders the Warm Springs Reservation. And so um, unbeknownst to me at the outset of my work, a lot of my historical review for Madras, but also a lot of my understanding of the contemporary context, the context of um, IGR and, uh, and civic capacity in Madras relates directly to the, the, American Indian population um, more generally, but the Warm Springs population specifically. Um, and so I don't know if I have a direct question for you or more of a comment, but my, my work involved primarily talking to city administrators um, and county administrators. And there were a couple of, a, a couple of um, relationship 
I guess IGR examples that that were shared with me, um, schools were involved in this. That and and the Plateau Travel Center, which is located in the city limits of Madras, but is owned and operated by the Warm Springs tribes. Um, just really complex IGR relationships, like you say, um, but also a, a very clear. <sighs> What I, what I found from city and county administrators were sort of um, a functional understanding of what it meant to be working with a sovereign nation, but a lot of resentment in, in working with those relationships. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And I'm wondering, I, I guess I'm gonna leave it as a comment, um, but also ask if you reached into the Madras area or looked at at anything that was happening on an even uh, more local level than, than the state tribal relationship. Yeah, no, I think that is, um, it, it, yeah, it's a fantastic point. I, at the onset of this paper, I was looking at um, a lot of the literature that was existing around the case study at the time was how there was like this a mutual aid occurring and how, you know, the indigenous, uh, how the Warm Springs tribe was engaging with local communities to address um, disaster needs and infrastructural needs. And there's not a lot of formal literature on it out there from what I was initially getting. Um, and exactly why I decided to refer, like just to keep my, my case study um, to intergovernmental relationships is because those, those networks of um, communities outside the tribe, there was just simply not enough information on them at the time. Um, and I think it's, I was looking more so at state actors, um, but I think, like you said, um, kind of civilian, like individual communities um, is also a fantastic way of engaging with this because looking at how knowledge systems and um, um, knowledge systems and cultural values are kind of used as a way to engage with different communities is a fantastic way of looking at how, you know, communities come together to address disaster. And I think surrounding communities would be if, like looking at surrounding communities and how they're interacting with the tribe would be a fantastic way of looking at like and even um, looking at how non-Indigenous and Indigenous actors are um, creating shared value to address. Um, communal issues. Yeah, thanks for that. And I have a follow up comment. Yeah. So I'm so glad to say that you are, have a moving towards the intergovernment relationship aspect because uh, I think there is a lot uh, that you can find. Uh, and in analyzing the intergovernmental relationship, I think there is a way to bring in social capital as a training concept in the relationship. Mm -hmm. And I have the feeling that not much had been done to apply the social capital concept in analyzing those political relationships or governmental relationships. So that part uh, really fascinates me, that combination. And so I really want you to keep doing this study. Um, and then I want to kind of elaborate on my pitch. Uh, I don't know what you have decided after you graduated, but uh, I really, really would like you to consider applying to TSU for the MTA program. And I see a lot, and this is for all of you. I, you know, if you are not in the master's program or if you are looking for the second program, consider us. But just uh, for Emma, um, in our MTA program, uh, we have a very strong local government uh, emphasis. And that's where we can kind of and talk a lot about the intergovernmental relationship. We also have a, a faculty member. Uh, in an institute who are interested in looking at the tribal government. And so we have an institute on tribal government, and we have a faculty member doing research focusing on that uh, native indigenous community. 
So uh, I'm pretty sure that empathy will be interested in what you are trying to do. And then uh, we are a participating department in our newly created emergency management and community resilience uh, program. And so you, you, you kind of uh, uh, put uh, the, the highlighting the disaster as a way to look into a larger issue. But uh, if you want to bring in the emergency management and community resilience aspect, we also have uh, the director of the emergency management and community resilience program also work very closely with the tribal government. And so when I heard your presentation, all the people between the PSU circle who were also be accepted as much as I do, popped up. And so please, please, please consider. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Yeah, I, I definitely shall. And I'm, I'm still trying to finesse my way into convincing the others to join us for the PAP PhD uh program but yeah emma i think this is very timely um one thing i've noticed in consulting firms lately the uh, social capital piece is that a lot of uh consulting organizations related to uh, um, human resources are shifting towards hiring folks who are looking at social capital and how you manage that mm -hmm. so i do think that's very timely and i think that relates to yvette's uh, presentation earlier about how do you tap into that social capital that so many people have and how do we start uh, highlighting that those um, sources of power and using those sources of power to increase uh, the representation responsiveness to diverse needs uh, in our government. So yeah. um, we're going to take a quick break uh give you all we're going to give you all about three minutes to take a quick break and feel free to take bio breaks as you see fit uh etc but we will reconvene at 11 well let's just do 11 10 we'll reconvene at 11 10 i gave you an extra 30 seconds and then uh we will move on to our second portion of the symposium
Okay, everybody, we are going to reconvene. Our, our most important person has returned, Jess, since you are <laughs> presenting. Uh, so um, I'm going to go ahead and proceed with the introduction, and then I will introduce Jess more. Um, more de in a more detailed way. So now we move our topic to that of justice and accountability. In a technological world where media is more accessible than ever, the implications for government have been plenty. The highly viewed video that depicts George Floyd's death at the hands of a frontline bureaucrat decreased an already declining trust in government amongst the community. Calls for accountability and transparency have resulted in efforts to enhance legitimacy of public organizations, especially of those related to criminal justice. Jess Wanich will pre present on how the implementation of body-worn cameras encompasses a variety of advantages and disadvantages. Following, Emily Thompson will present policy alternatives of how to reform the legal system in Oregon and Washington. Let me pull up the, sorry, one second. I'm trying to pull up the, um, my apologies. <laughs> it's always difficult when you're trying to figure out what am I trying to display? Um, it's not. Okay, so. My share screen is being funky, but let's just do this. Okay. So Jess Fuanich is a first year graduate student obtaining his master's of public administration degree at the Evans School of Public Policy and Governance at the University of Washington. Um, Jess also is formerly of Seattle University. Jess's research interests intersect with his racial equity lens with his prior research reports and evaluating areas such as environmental health, social justice, technology policy, platform accessibility, privacy, and access to equitable information and journalism for underrepresented communities. Jess plans to pursue a career as a researcher delving into social policy, analysis and evaluation, and or education to provide recommendations on how programs can be better efficient, informed, and equitable in their impact and approach. So as you all know, very timely, uh, as we reckon with how do we use these technologies, how do we make these technologies accessible, how do we use them for accountability and transparency. So Jess, very excited, and I'm going to hand it over to you now. All right, awesome. Uh, bear with me as I share my screen. Uh, one second here. Okay, can everyone see it? Awesome. All right, so um, my research paper was on uh, the implementation of body-worn cameras, um, looking at opportunities, risks, privacy concerns, and the use of facial recognition technology. And my interest in this area stemmed from uh, right before COVID, actually, I was on a working group um, looking at tech equity, especially here in Seattle. Um, there were talks about implementing a moratorium on the use of facial recognition technology um, with the Port of Seattle. So the Port of Seattle manages um, SeaTac Airport, as well as other um, cruise ship and terminal hubs um, across the Puget Sound area. And one of the things that was attached to that was the bias and surveillance, um, as well as increased policing of communities of color. Uh, and that really uh, drew an interest to me in seeing how policy can implement um, that altogether, especially with facial recognition technology, gaining the ground um, as we're moving forward into this new decade. So with that, um, I have a quick outline of what I'm going to talk about. So I'm going to introduce the um, paper a little bit, talk about some methods, um, some key findings and claims, uh, have a little discussion, and then uh, provide my recommendations and then I'll open it up for questions at the end. 
So looking into the meat of this, um, the main problems that uh, I researched on, like looked at multiple uh, literature on this was that there is excessive use of force by police and law enforcement, uh, which has led to increase arrests and unwanted interactions towards people of color, uh, primarily black, indigenous, and uh, Latinx groups. Um, in addition to that, 25% of police departments across the United States have implemented um, the use of body-worn cameras, and 80% are studying effects of this technology. And most recently, the Obama administration equipped body-worn cameras to local police departments um, in an effort to curb stop and frisks. Um, and for those that aren't aware of what stop and frisks are, uh, it was a policy implemented by Mayor Bloomberg uh, in the early mid-2000s in New York City um, as uh, an intended way to mitigate crime, um, especially in communities of color. Obviously, there were detrimental effects that um, led to increased incarceration um, and increased surveillance. Um, so the use of equipping more departments with body-worn cameras came out of a study and review from the Department of Justice um, as a way to uh, further hinder that increased incarceration and effect from there. Oh. All right. Um, so looking at opportunities, uh, there were these three um, that I was able to gather from my research. The first one was the easing of civilian and officer interactions. Uh, for one, um, Freud found that when civilians would interact with police officers in different types of settings, um, that they were more at ease knowing that you know there was a recording or documentation of that process. Um, that kind of leads into the second piece here with the documentation of evidence for reports, knowing that there is a burden of proof that um, both parties have in terms of any interaction or altercation um, or escalation of that sorts, um, knowing that you know you have physical proof of um, on video uh, for whatever happens, and that can also implement how uh, police are able to document. Um, different types of uh, incidents reports. Uh, lastly here, Newell also found uh, the increased transparency and accountability. This was especially important in understanding how, um, you know, amid different community concerns between communities of color and police departments, um, it's important to have that record of evidence to go back, um, you know, towards any instance of bias that a police officer or anyone in law enforcement may have, um, but to also hold them accountable to, you know, if there is um, any type of indication where what they said on the record in court was different, they can refer to uh, that body-worn camera footage um, in terms of what was on the record. But that is to say, however, that body-worn cameras um, also come with different types of concerns and risks. Um, so these were also three that um, I found here. Hall and Coyne mentioned the militarization of the police. Um, as I mentioned earlier, when the Obama administration um, provided funding through the Department of Justice, um, I think it's called a JAG grant, um, Justice Assistance Grant or something of that nature, um, that increases the more militarization of the police um, to be more equipped with higher technology and surveillance, so not only with body-worn cameras, but thinking about um, heavy-duty tactical gear, looking at different types of software to collect metadata on um, people in cities. That leads to a lack of privacy in public settings. So thinking about you know areas you frequent, whether it's a hospital, whether it's a library, whether it's an airport, you know there's bound to be some type of surveillance whether there's um, a security camera, whether there's a law enforcement officer present, you know, that really infringes upon your privacy in these public settings. Because um, it leads to this third point here with the storage of metadata obtained through body-worn cameras. So yes, although that you can get um, recorded and photographed through such footage or documentation, um, there is a way for uh, software to collect information on you based on physical features, traits, characteristics, 
uh, and that can also lead to instances of racial and gender bias, uh, which I'll explain in um, future slides. So this led to my research questions. I had two here. The first one is, what are the advantages and disadvantages of body-worn cameras, BWCs, used in policing? And the second is, what are potential privacy risks of body-worn cameras? And what are its implications Sorry, when paired with facial recognition technology? So looking at methods, um, these were the three I just mainly use. Uh, looking at database searches with keywords, so whether it was facial recognition technology, um, body-worn cameras, policing, surveillance, use of force. Um, that was really helpful in terms of collecting information and research related to my paper. I also wanted to limit studies conducted primarily in the United States, understanding that policing in the United States is its own um, type of field, and there's a lot of research on this as well. Um, but it is interesting to look at different international aspects of it. I really wanted to focus on this um, just because of what I was interested in, primarily in the Seattle region, um, but also across the country. And I also wanted to look at empirical studies and peer-reviewed material only, um, just so that I had a basis of building off prior research um, and hopefully to conduct more research on this in the future. So looking at some key findings and claims, um, here's just a quick little chart of um, the different uh, authors that I took a look at. So looking at the first two, I'm not gonna go too in depth into it, but the first two focused on advantages of body-worn cameras. So the first was a study in Phoenix. This one was a little bit limited because it was a convenience sample. So they looked at how um, having body-worn cameras was helpful in terms of documentation for reports. In the second study here, we can see that it was with campus safety patrol officers. And I was a little surprised to learn about this and knowing that uh, campus safety officers in this study had access to body-worn cameras. That's something that I've never seen before, at least through my undergraduate experience. Um, but they talked about officers um, being perceived in a positive light um, by better by better having um, interactions um, with people on campus. Um, but this was through a survey, so it wasn't through any type of field experiment, so that's something to consider. And the last two uh, here um, were highlights of disadvantages. So looking at the Grother and Nan and Hannah Oka study, they had a sample size of 1.6 million. This was looking at um, photographs and demographics pulled from uh, police departments both in the US and I think um, internationally this was like with Interpol I believe as well but they took those sets of photographs they ran algorithms through their facial recognition technology and they found that there were instances of racial bias um, in that they had false positives among people who identified as Native American African American and Asian American. And what that basically means is that, um, so one can self-identify with any particular uh, race or gender group, but when it came down to the technology um, trying to identify them correctly, it gave them um, a race or um, gender category other than the one that they identified with. Um, so that's problematic in that it causes uh, a lot of racial bias and can influence um, how this technology is implemented. And lastly here um, at the Sherman, Paul, and Brubaker study, this one was primarily in the U.S., they found that there was a disadvantage with facial recognition technology being biased towards people of different gender identities. So they had a similar concept in that they had multiple photos of different people. Um, those people already self-identified, but then when the technology and software ran through all the photos, um, there was um, different uh, gender specifications or um, identifiers that were different from what those people self-identified as. So that's really important to consider in terms of how facial recognition technology has that limitation, um, both in considering racial and gender bias. Um, yeah, so this is kind of a <laughs> summary of what I said earlier. Um, so just to reiterate for the first 
study there, body-worn cameras can help officers to write accurate reports in stressful situations. With a second one here, body-worn cameras can infringe upon one's personal privacy as sensitive crime plays into when cameras should be disengaged. Uh, this was a big claim here for this study in that because that study was um, across different campuses and universities, you know, there are some limitations when it comes to um, HIPAA, so one's health privacy, and then also FERPA when it comes to educational privacy. Um, and considering that, you know, college campuses, you know, are, you know, different grounds and different things can happen. So when it comes down to campus safety officers or anyone in campus law enforcement um, interacting with members of the public, there should be some uh, sense of uh, privacy and engagement when it comes to that. And then the last two, looking at uh, how facial recognition technology can have instances of bias. So looking into discussion and recommendations, uh, just quickly here, research on body-worn cameras um, assist law enforcement produces mixed results. Um, based on the table I showed you, there are both advantages and disadvantages there. Also, evidence suggests that body-worn cameras encroach upon private settings, like I mentioned earlier, either in hospitals or dorm rooms. Um, and there is research that points to the capability of facial recognition technology and body-worn cameras being connected through metadata dragnets. This is going back to the point where you know one can have um, you know different identifiers attached to them through this software, but that may be different than how that person self-identifies as, whether it's race, gender, or any um, classification. So some recommendations I have here, um, thinking about proper equity training of law enforcement with body-worn cameras. Um, so this kind of curbs down to the, you know, advantages that I was talking about, you know, holding police departments accountable and transparent when it comes to interactions, but also thinking about how, you know, there is the capability of those two things being paired together and knowing that there are instances of bias with research um, experiments, you know, um, alluding to that, it is important to think about how equity plays into um, that implementation. Second here is eliminating pairing of facial recognition and body-worn cameras. This is a little bit harder to recommend and implement, but what I mean specifically here is um, the use of metadata, um, especially concerning that, you know, that can have different implement implications when it comes down to police departments using that data to track um, and connect, you know, other people to different instances where, you know, some person may be found guilty for a crime, but then it may link them to other people. Um, and that can just increase surveillance and uh, an infringement upon privacy um, for people that are just involved and wrapped up in that. And lastly, just to have tighter regulations for the protection of privacy in public settings. Um, this doesn't necessarily um, hint upon body-worn cameras, but more upon facial recognition technology. Um, so an example of this, looking at how the Port of Seattle um, banned facial recognition technology at SeaTac Airport and all their facilities, um, that can be an example of how um, we can regulate and protect uh, one's privacy in different settings. And with that, um, that's the end of my presentation. If there's any questions, uh, please feel free to uh, ask. Thank you all. All right, great work, Jess. Um, we actually, we have a few questions teed up for you already. Um, yeah, I, I think this is so fascinating, right? Because um, one thing I noticed is last week I was at the International City and County Managers Association Conference and in the exhibitor hall, so many businesses were there related to automation. So how do we do automation in an effective um, and equitable way? So your first question, and you kind of touched on a little bit of this um, in your, your uh, findings, but um, what's, so you said it was a few schools for the Pelfrey and Keener. Do you know which schools those were or like a region or anything? And also it's a multi-parter. Did they have any information on whether or not they spoke uh, with the student body about 
how they felt about being recorded and then part b or part c did it improve did it improve the uh security relationship between student and campus yeah. and that's in the chat if you want to reread it yeah and thank you for the multi-parter <laughs> i'm really up to dig into this uh i think in terms of the school um from what i remember from the research i would have to go back to get the specific school but it was in the southwest area so colorado arizona area um and did they speak with a student body they did not speak with a student body it was mainly just um qualitative surveys that they sent out um improve student campus security relations Ooh, that's a good one uh i don't know exactly it was just kind of like a um I don't know how you'd describe it, but like a timestamp type study. So it was just in that one particular time. They didn't do like a multi-year over year um, study on that. But I think if there was opportunity for research into that, I would definitely want to delve into that. But yeah, these are all good questions. Excellent. And then we had, uh, what are your thoughts on facial readiness facial recognition technology and uh, whether or not it perpetuates gender violence and discrimination. Mm. Yeah, I have <laughs> a lot of personal thoughts around facial recognition technology. Um, you know, just knowing that that's also used, like if anyone has an iPhone, that's used for face ID, that's used for when you're walking into a sporting event or concert. Um, especially now with COVID-19 and the pandemic, the use of facial rec recognition technology is even more important when, you know, scanning people's temperatures. So, you know, I understand the uses for it, but I do agree with the fact that, you know, because of the racial and gender bias attached to that, I really think that, you know, whatever companies, whatever firms are, you know, investing in, researching and experimenting on this technology really need to consider um, the equity implications of that because I feel like if that's continued you know there's going to be a more increased surveillance policing state um, and facial rec recognition technology will just be a tool to help strengthen that and you know that can be problematic as we've seen in the last like five to ten years um, that also leads to you know a lot of xenophobia and transphobia and a lot of different things there. So yeah, just being very mindful of that. Uh, I, I'm not a tech expert by any means, but if there was an opportunity to pair with, you know, different people to do more research on this, I'd love to delve into that more. Great. And Jennifer Lee Anderson asked, um, did you review any studies that address the issue of law enforcement officers having the discretion to turn their cameras on and off at will? If so, how does that degree of discretion impact issues of community trust? Yes, um, I do believe there was a study um, related to uh, turning off the cameras on and off at will. In terms of the degree of discretion impact, impacting issues of community trust, um, I'm not too sure about that. I would have to refer back to the research on that. Okay, and uh, Jess, we're gonna move it along a little more quickly just to make sure that we have enough time for Emily. Uh, but you have two more questions. So one is, uh, do you know anything about where this data is being stored, the micro data that you described? And then also this, the, uh, the last question was, um, what do you mean by equity training? Mm. Yeah, so for the first question in terms of the storage of data, so police departments have this thing called dragnets, um, and that's basically kind of like an intranet, which is like an internal um, internet network where they have lots of access to different data. So anything that's pulled from a body-worn camera can be used and collected from their metadata, so anything that's like on a interaction or incidents report can be pulled from that, and there's like different like things that are sorted into that, which is kind of beyond uh, the research that I did. And yeah, it's just stored in there. They can't really delete that or like do anything with that information. I think because of the 
um, Freedom of Information Act. And then Seattle has their own thing about um, information as well. So uh, yeah, it is a crime if you delete anything related to government um, uh, documents or documentation. So that's a good question. And then the last one here um, in terms of equity training, uh, this one kind of just ties into race equity training. Um, so here in Seattle, um, they have this thing called the Race and uh, Justice Initiative or some kind of toolkit to help think about how equity plays a role in different systems and structures. Um, so I think I made a recommendation in the paper towards the Seattle Police Department in providing equity training, but also thinking about how that um, also connects to the use of body worn cameras as well. Um, Cause I know that again, you know, the implementation is still a little slow across the country. So if there is a way to implement that across the country, um, it will take time, but I think it's a necessary part of how um, they should think about that. Well, Jess, this is a very, a, an extremely timely topic and you have a few timely topics. You have equity, you have law enforcement, and then you also have cyber hints of cybersecurity. So uh, I I think this is this really sums up how do we grapple with all these these converging issues and uh, and how do we try with the account to maintain accountability and transparency. Um, and also, I just want to pitch that PSU has a cybersecurity center of excellence. So if you feel yourself going that way, come talk to us. Um, but our uh, last but certainly not least presenter is Emily Thompson. And Emily has a really cool resume. Um, Emily Thompson attended the U University of Tennessee, Knoxville, go Vols, and Washington State University, where she was a three time competitor at the NCAA championships on the varsity women's rowing team. She graduated in 2018 with a bachelor's of arts degree in both communication and society and in criminal justice. So not only is it a three-time competitor, three-time degree person, Emily will graduate from Seattle University's Master of Public Administration program in December 2021. That's very close. Her research interests include the cash bail system, the use of pretrial detention, and alternatives to incarceration. Emily's experience, in, in, experience includes roles in the Communication Center at Seattle University and in the Elson S. Floyd Cultural Center at Washington State University. In addition, Emily has spent time spent time doing volunteer work with the ACLU of Washington. She is planning to continue her career in public administration with a focus on policy change in the criminal legal system. So uh, I think it's no secret that the criminal legal system uh, is not a justice system right now. And Emily is going to outline uh, what's happening and what we can do about it. Take it away, Emily. Thank you. Okay, Yvette and I just played musical chairs, so I'm gonna try to share my screen on her computer now. Let's just, can everybody see my screen? I don't, I don't know. Yes. It's all good? Okay, perfect. Well, good morning, everyone. Thank you, Diane, for the introduction. And thank you to the ASPA Cascade chapter for organizing this event. It's really exciting to have a platform to talk about our research. So I appreciate everybody coming to listen in today. Um, as a Seattle resident, I've had the opportunity to be surrounded by very progressive policy and progressive policymakers and innovative community organizers and highly engaged community members at a very pivotal time in American politics. Despite the fact that, is, are my slides moving? Yeah. Okay, perfect. Okay, sorry about that. Despite the fact that voters in the Pacific Northwest have traditionally voted for progressive policies, there are significantly um, there are significant disparities that exist throughout the criminal legal system. In urban counties in Washington and Oregon, disparities in the pretrial detention system are crucial and in need of urgent attention. In King County, in King County, which is Washington's most populous county, 77% of people that are held in jails are being detained pretrial. And in Oregon's most populous county, Multnomah County, an estimated 45% of people are being held pretrial. 
Pretrial detention refers to um, having somebody incarcerated in jail until their trial date, and judges have the discretion to determine if an eligible uh, if, an if an individual is going to be eligible for bail or not. Um, so sometimes at the bail hearing, somebody might be denied bail for public safety or flight reasons. Um, but in most cases, people will be eligible for bail. But the reason that people will remain incarcerated until their trial date is because they cannot afford to pay bail. Um, I would like to note that in Oregon, commercial bail bond services are prohibited. Um, however, the state still requires somebody to make a 10% deposit for their bail that's paid directly to a court clerk. So in many cases, this 10% figure, depending on what that bail amount is, might still be completely out of somebody's financial reach. Um, in Washington, commercial bail bonds companies are permitted to operate. And so an individual will either have to raise collateral to use a bail bond service, or they pay that cash amount to the court clerk. Not only has pretrial detention increased jail populations, um, like you can see in this diagram here, um, despite overall decreases in detainees across Washington and Oregon, um, you can see that there's still a pretty high amount of people that are detained pretrial, and so that pretrial detention has been cited as a major reason for high incarceration rates um, throughout the throughout both states. People of color also make up 47% of the secure population in King County, despite Black and Native American populations making up less than 10% of the county's population. Um, so pretrial detention has absolutely exacerbated racial disparities that exist in the criminal legal system. Um, this is a similar issue in Multnomah County jails where black adults were 8.3 times more likely to be in jail pretrial and Latinx adults were 1.8 times more likely to be incarcerated pretrial. Um, and so the problem with this, the use of pretrial detention is being detained for any length of time before um, trial can lead to the loss of employment, housing, um, loss of child custody, and a lot of connections to medical care and social service resources that are pretty necessary in a lot of people's lives. Um, so the research that I'm presenting today seeks to propose policy alternatives that will hopefully reduce the number of people that are detrained pretrial across urban counties in Washington and Oregon. The policy alternatives include the implementation of electronic monitoring in place of pretrial detention. In this case, um, that would be the use of ankle monitoring or other forms of monitoring um, that would use GPA tracking that send data to a collection center and then to a monitoring agency. The next policy alternative would be to eliminate the use of cash bail totally. Um, and this would release defendants on their own recognizance um, with the expectation and the requirement that they would return to court for their scheduled court date. And then the last policy alternative is expanding the use of pretrial diversion programs. And these programs typically are um, at the pre-charge stage. So they're used completely as an alternative to any sort of prosecution or incarceration. It gets people connected with some sort of caseworker and delivery of social services. So um, all of these um, social services would be assessed on an individual basis. Um, the individual would meet with a caseworker and determine if they need um, access to housing, mental health services, drug treatment, or what kind of services would best help them um, avoid being justice involved in the future. So using a policy matrix, and this was adapted by Meltzer and Schwartz, um, some of their policy evaluation um, criterion. Um, I chose effectiveness, equity, efficiency, political feasibility, and social acceptability. And they'll all be broken down in more detail as they're applied to each of the alternatives. So effectiveness refers to um, measuring policy alternatives to determine if they're actually achieving their proposed goals and objectives. Um, in this case, the goal would be to reduce the number of people who are detained pre-trial. So by looking at the current use of electronic monitoring, in 2019, the average jail population in King County was just over 1,500 people. 
And despite a 468% increase of electronic monitoring over five years between 2015 and 2020, only one in 11 defendants was actually released from pretrial detention with electronic monitoring in place. In Multnomah County, um, the, the stats were pretty low as well. Out of 2,948 defendants released in Multnomah County to pretrial any form of pretrial supervision, only 157 were released to some form of electronic monitoring. So the use of electronic monitoring exists in urban counties in Oregon and Washington, um, but the enrollment is pretty low right now. Um, the same goes for pretrial diversion programs. There's a couple of pretrial diversion programs that exist in Seattle, King County, um, but in so basically there was one program, the Let Everyone Advance with Dignity program, um, formerly known as the Law Enforcement Assisted Diversion Program. It started in King County in 2011, so it's been pretty highly researched. It launched in Multnomah County in 2017, but data showed that only four participants participated in the program in 2019 in Multnomah County. So enrollment remains um, very low. In order to measure effectiveness of electronic monitoring, I looked at data where electronic monitoring has been used in other states um, for similar reasons, um, public safety reasons of various forms. In Florida, um, electronic monitoring was effective in reducing the likelihood of offending for those sentenced to home confinement. And the study also showed a 94% reduction in the likelihood of a return to jail compared to those who weren't on any form of electronic monitoring. Um, other studies have shown that people are more likely to return to court if they are participants in an electronic monitoring program. And in Arizona, um, in a small pilot study, they had just over 150 defendants who were under electronic monitoring. The failure to appear rate back to court nationally is 29%. Um, and that number actually dropped to 5% in Arizona um, where this electronic monitoring program um, was studied. In Multnomah County, it's estimated that nearly 60,000 jail beds were saved as a result of implementing electronic monitoring defendants. Um, and so where it is being used, um, it is effective and so it just needs to be used on a, a larger scale. Um, when, I, when looking at effectiveness for the elimination of cash bail, um, it's, it's been implemented or it's been eliminated as a policy in certain cities across the United States in a new pretrial services program that almost essentially um, eliminates the cash bail system in New Jersey. The number of people who held pretrial was reduced by 35% in a three-year period um, through this new pretrial services program. And in the District of Columbia, which was one of the first places in the United States that um, nearly eliminated um, the use of cash bail. They have 94% of defendants are released um, pretrial. So it's a pretty high level and they've been doing this for a couple of decades now. They have a 91% return rate to court um, despite not holding people on a bond. Lastly, in a study of the King County um, Diversion Program lead, they found that 46% were more likely to been, have been on the employment continuum at some point during the follow-up um, versus at their baseline study. Um, they also had 60% lower odds of arrest during the six months after evaluation entry. And they also had a 58% lower chance of another arrest over a period longer than six months. So those enrolled in the Let Everyone Advance with Dignity program had pretty great results of not being involved in the criminal legal system, um, even beyond six months after participating in these programs. Now, efficiency refers to the policy's goals and benefits in, to re in relation to its cost. And so the goal for efficiency would be to achieve a, goal, a balance between the number of people detained pretrial and the cost associated with the results. Um, so in the Arizona program, um, the city saved 74, almost $74 per day when they implemented electronic monitoring. And in another study, they found that it costs 7461 to detain an individual pretrial, but it only costs $7.17 to 
supervise them pretrial using electronic monitoring. So there are major cost savings um, for the county where this has been implemented already. Um, in another cost benefit analysis by the Oregon Criminal Justice Commission, they use a methodology that imposed a three day limit on pretrial detention for defendants who were charged with non person misdemeanors drug charges failure to appear charges so other low level non violent crimes. Um, and they estimated a net benefit of nearly $10 million to increase the rate of pretrial release as. Um, shown in their study analysis. Um, and, and so they, they found a huge cost savings for the county there. Um, likewise, the lead program in King County um, has an initial startup cost of $899 and then $532 per month. And that's to cover all the access to social services um, and all the services that come along with this program. Um, compared to $147 per day to incarcerate somebody in a King County Correctional Facility. So the startup cost is a little bit higher, but over time, as somebody is a participant in this program, it levels off and it ends up being a cost savings for the county. Equity refers to the idea that costs and benefits are distributed equally among, or equitably amongst all residents with the goal of avoiding placing a risk or burden on any one group based on their age, socioeconomic status, gender orientation, race, or ethnicity. Um, pretrial detention has a very, very significant equity component because the use of pretrial detention cannot be equitable at its core. Um, the policy is always going to directly impact low income people. And when you see kind of the, the domino effect that pretrial detention has, um, for case outcomes, it, it's more significant than just not having enough money to, to pay bail. It, it really dominoes to so many different levels of one's life. Um, so defendants who are detained for their entire pretrial period were nearly four times more likely to be sentenced to prison when it came to um, a comparison against people who actually were released at some point before trial. Um, studies have shown that those from lower socioeconomic backgrounds traditionally have worse case outcomes when processed by the legal system. Um, the typical detained defendant would need to spend eight months income to cover 10 months money bail, um, according to COPS study, and, and a $10,000 bail is not super high in the grand scheme of what, what bails are being charged nationally. Um, a national study also found that individuals from lower income zip codes were more likely to be detained pretrial than those from wealthier zip codes. And in nine Oregon counties, those who were detained pretrial were 2.4 times more likely to be sentenced to incarceration than those who were released pretrial. From a racial equity perspective, um, despite progressive leaders and passing progressive policies in King County, um, the racial disparities are very significant in jails. 37% um, of people who were booked into local jails were black, despite the King County population being 7% black. Indigenous people make up 2.5% of King County local jail populations, despite making up less than 1% of the county population. And in Multnomah County jails, black adults were 4.2% four times more likely, Latinx adults were 1.1 times more likely, and Native American adults were 2.4 times more likely to be booked into jail than white adults. Um, from a financial equity perspective, charging defendants for the cost of their electronic monitoring fees is also out of reach for many. Um, in Multnomah County, they actually did some reform last year. Um, and as of 2020, um, the Multnomah County Department of Community Justice said that they were no longer gonna collect supervision fees from justice involved individuals. However, in King County, people are still responsible for those fees. And so if you are placed on electronic monitoring, um, you'll have to pay for the service, which ranges from $0 to $26 a day. So some people can get fee waivers, but that is a very small percentage. And anybody else who gets placed on it might be on the hook for over $20 a day to be on electronic monitoring. Um, in Alameda County, California, this resulted in a civil rights complaint um, against the county because they were um, charging people for their own monitoring that the belief was that the county should 
pay for that type of monitoring. Um, the Oregon Advisory Committee to the U.S. Commission on Civil Rights found that imposing a fee for the very use of the device can be viewed as predatory, as these individuals may have challenges with employment due to the legal charges imposed against them. Um, so the Oregon Advisory Committee to the U.S. Commission on Civil Rights um, really recognized that there are already barriers um, due to people being involved with the legal or the criminal legal system and um, imposing additional financial responsibility on them um, would make would increase barriers that they face. Mm -hmm. Um, so political feasibility refers to the extent in which elected officials and policymakers will support the policy initiative. Um, and so the goal here would be to maximize how many elected officials want to support the policies. Um, in King County, there are various departments that are now acknowledging the beneficial forms of social services that can be um, housed outside of jail. And so they've recognized a positive impact that pretrial release programs can have. Um, and so King County is moving towards um, more political feasibility. Um, in Multnomah County, um, the Multnomah County Chair, Jebra Calfrey, also stated that the county has been intentional about listening to the voices of the communities most impacted by inequitable systems. And so they are working with dramatically reimagining public safety and um, recognize the ur urgency and the importance of the work. Social acceptability um, refers to the level of support that a proposed policy has by the public in an area affected by the policy. Um, and there's absolutely a lack of research measuring the public's perceptions on electronic monitoring as a substitute specifically for pretrial detention. Um, there's a lack of research on how people feel about eliminating cash bail um, and how people feel in general um, about these pretrial detention programs. So um, I did pull a little bit of research looking at similar areas, not quite um, pretrial detention, um, but people felt in a study measuring public perceptions on ankle monitoring for convicted sex offenders, 32% um, of respondents felt that the monitoring was very effective and 47% thought it was somewhat effective. Um, and in Multnomah County, um, they found that the use of electronic monitoring might make victims feel safer. The ACLU of Kansas found that 94% of Kansans want their local prosecutor to use diversion more often. And in community meetings between local businesses and um, people who were organizers with the Let Everyone Advance with Dignity program, they found that a lot of business owners were wanting to take a different approach rather than um, incarceration. And so there was a lot of willing, willingness between business owners to want to work with diversion programs, um, especially for cases where there might be shoplifts or other um, kind of reoccurring issues at their business. So after this rigorous um, policy analysis of all these criterion, um, the policy recommendation that I made from this research would be the expansion of pretrial diversion programs in Washington and Oregon. Um, I think that the program should be magnified to serve a greater number of people and expand on the eligibility for people to enroll in the programs. Um, so in that case, um, more people should be eligible for the program and just get those enrollment rates up, um, incarcerating less people pretrial and enrolling more people at the pretrial stage into these programs. Um, I think that the reallocation of funds from other areas of the county budget would be necessary to make this feasible. Right now, 74% of the King County General Fund goes to public safety, um, and 21.3% of the general fund um, is spent on adult and juvenile detention, um, which is $276 million each biennium is just spent on incarceration alone, but only $2.7 million was allocated for diversion programs in the last budget. Um, so I do believe that there's um, importance for reallocation of funds for these pretrial diversion programs, and, and I think the money could be shifted from one area to another. Um, in Multnomah County, $152 million in 2019 was proposed for the Sheriff's Department, 
$63.2 million was directed to corrections facilities. And despite this budget allocation, only four out of 12,000 defendants arraigned um, were actually um, sent into pretrial diversion programs. Um, Multnomah County also reallocated just over $2 million towards diversion program initiatives. Um, but in both counties, that's representing around roughly 1% of budget allocations. And so my policy recommendation would just be more budget funds going to that and reallocating those dollars to expand those programs. In conclusion, um, elected officials um, across the Pacific Northwest have historically and consistently passed progressive policies that serve as the model for the rest of the nation. And I think that leaders across Oregon and Washington should be called upon to support further research and invest in innovative methods um, regarding pretrial pre diversion programs that better serve the needs of justice involved individuals and communities throughout the Pacific Northwest. Thank you. Thank you, Emily. So I know that we're at time. So um, before we before we uh, open it up to see if anyone has questions for Emily, which I don't see any currently, we wanted to take a um, a, a group photo. Um, so Emily, could you would you mind turning your uh, screen share yes. off? Um. That can always be tricky. Excellent. So if everyone could just turn their um, cameras on. Oh, yeah. So we have our names. <laughs> <laughs> that makes sense. That would be so weird if we had it on there. All right. So for those of us who are here, um, OK, Sarah, were you going to take the photo or do you want me to? Um, I was actually going to trust that our recording could be a screenshot later. Oh, that makes which, sense. Which prevents me from having to do more technical related stuff. Here, I'm also gonna take a screenshot. So everyone smile. Yay. Okay, I got it. Fabulous, fabulous. To click. <laughs> Yay. Okay, so I'm gonna hand it. Wonderful job, Emily. Wow, I had no idea. That's a very robust policy analysis. I had no idea how much money uh, so was passed on to the person who has to wear that. Um, I'm going to hand it over to Sarah for closing remarks. And Emily, uh, since no one does, no one has questions right now, can you leave your email in the chat just in case questions do arise? Thank um, you. Yeah, I do. I want to wrap up very, very quickly because I, I realize we're two minutes over. Um, I know folks have to skate on. So thank you all for joining us. Thank you to our four presenters. Um, I will follow up with the four of you almost immediately with an email that sort of covers our ASPA membership offer and um, other things coming down the line. So look out for continued communications from me. Um, and it looks like we were hoping to have a survey to share through the link, but it doesn't look like we're, we're coordinated quite well enough to do that this time around. Um, so I will leave it at this. Thank you uh, on behalf of ASPA Cascade chapter. Um, again, this is the first of hopefully uh, more student symposia to come. And um, it's been really exciting for us to put this. Uh, yes, Diane says we'll send a, a survey post symposium. Um, it's been really exciting for us to, to bring all these ideas together and uh, hopefully stay connected and see where they go in the future. So thanks for joining us. Really appreciate your time. Take care, everybody. Have a great weekend for those of you who get those.